Hello wonderful person, this is Anton, and today we're going to be discussing our moon, and more specifically, a potential resolution to a relatively old mystery. The mystery that was originally discovered back when the Apollo astronauts returned some of the rocks from the moon, in the process discovering that a lot of these rocks contain signs of a relatively powerful magnetosphere. The magnetosphere that at some point seemed to have been even more powerful than the magnetosphere of planet Earth. But considering the size difference between the Earth and, of course, the Moon itself, explaining such a powerful magnetosphere has always been extremely difficult, with none of the explanations until this point being able to provide enough evidence explaining exactly what happened a few billion years ago. But that's until now. This new study that, as always, you can find in the description below, might have finally figured it out, allowing us to sort of understand what happens to a lot of these not-so-massive objects as they evolve over time, and more importantly, how this could have actually affected planet Earth as well. But let's start with the mystery itself. So, starting with the original Apollo missions, and actually during six separate missions, the early lunar astronauts collected approximately 2200 different samples, with a total weight of being approximately 380 kilograms, or about 840 pounds. And over the last few decades, thousands and thousands of microsamples from these rocks have been analyzed for a lot of different studies, with some of these studies obviously investigating the early magnetic field. And these investigations were over time able to create this map that you see right here, sort of showing us the general distribution of the magnetic field on the Moon right now, but also discovering that certain rocks, especially some of the older rocks, seem to have been actually formed in the presence of a very, very powerful magnetic field. And this is usually indicated by, for example, magnetic elements such as magnetite. Now, in this particular case, this didn't really make sense. It obviously suggested that the ancient moon might have had a very strong magnetic field despite its small size. But some of the previous studies have also measured the magnetic field, suggesting that it was at least twice as powerful as the one on Earth. I think there should be an older video somewhere right there about this topic. And the results from a lot of these studies sort of suggest that during this period right here, during the early lunar existence, there was an extremely strong magnetic field that might have lasted as long as a billion years. But it ended up weakening pretty quickly, and within the last one billion years or so, there was basically almost nothing left. And even though some of the studies originally suggested that maybe these early calculations were incorrect, a lot of the modern calculations using very modern equipment confirmed the results from a lot of these ancient Apollo rocks. But the question of course being, how and what exactly happened on the Moon a few billion years ago to make this happen? And before we can answer that, we obviously have to first understand how we think magnetic fields are formed inside planets like Earth. So today it's believed that the relatively strong magnetic field of planet Earth is generated by the internal dynamo of the planet, formed as the material circulates inside the outer core, generating the magnetic lines as a result. So this circulation of the magnetically charged material is what's most likely responsible for the formation of the magnetic field around our planet. But in order for this to happen, you do have to have a relatively high temperature inside the planet, and there also has to be some sort of a temperature gradient in order to drive the dynamo itself. Or basically, in order to create all of this motion on the inside, or the convection that produces a lot of the circulating material, there needs to be some sort of a hot, cold temperature gradient in order for all of this material to move around and to circulate. And because the material circulating in this case is magnetically charged, it ends up producing the magnetosphere of the planet. But the Moon is believed to be too small to make any of this happen, and the temperature on the inside is currently believed to be just a little bit too cold. And even though the early Moon was probably much hotter on the inside, the mantle surrounding the core in this case would not actually have enough of a temperature gradient to activate the convection necessary for the magnetic field to form, or basically it would not make things go around like in our planet, simply because the temperature between this and this is just not high enough. That's of course in theory, that's basically the assumptions we're making based on the observations and the studies from planet Earth. But the temperature inside was still pretty hot though, it was actually over 2000 Kelvin. So that means that in theory, if there was a sudden change in temperature, you could somehow produce the dynamo required to produce the magnetosphere. And so what exactly might have happened here on the Moon a few billion years ago in order to create these powerful magnetic fields? And the proposition slash explanation from this paper is based on the model they created kind of explaining what they believe might have happened. In this case, they refer to it as an episodic magnetic field, 
or I guess temporary magnetic field. The magnetic field that would form for maybe 100 years or so and would then disappear just to reappear sometime later. And this would explain why the samples from the moon seem to indicate very different levels of the magnetic field with at least two samples that are really really old possessing indicating signs of low magnetic field whereas the younger samples indicating much stronger magnetic field. But what exactly would activate this magnetic field and make it so strong for such a short time? Well, the explanation here is once again is based on our current understanding of how planetary objects like Moon and planet Earth form early on. Here it's believed that early on both objects were most likely covered by a relatively thick ocean of molten rock, basically a lava ocean. And as a lot of this ocean started to solidify, certain rocks that became more dense started to sink deeper into the planet or the moon in this case, and other parts that were less dense floated to the top. And this ancient magma ocean then mostly contained a lot of the heat producing elements such as for example thorium, uranium and so on, but also contained a lot of titanium as well. And because these materials were still hot and producing a lot of energy, they took much longer to cool down and to solidify. And in this case, as titanium starts to solidify and starts to crystallize, it creates these very large, very dense chunks that start to quite quickly sink into the moon itself. And based on moon's composition, based on the density on the moon, the calculations here suggest that the actual blobs of titanium produced would be around 60 kilometers in diameter and would then take um, anywhere from a few hundred million years to possibly a billion years to sink. And this process of sinking is actually known as gravitational overturn and in effect it sort of produces something similar to what you see right here. Okay, not really the bubbles though. As these pebbles sink to the bottom of the moon, because they're much cooler and because they obviously have different composition, they sort of create a lot of the effects around themselves. And because of the temperature difference, once they sink deep enough and potentially touch the moon's core, the temperature difference, or in this case the temperature gradient, then suddenly activates a major activity and major motion inside the moon, generating the dynamo required for the magnetosphere. But the magnetosphere in this case would not last for a very long time. Once the temperatures sort of stabilize and once the actual chunk of titanium warms up just enough, it stops the dynamo because the gradient is gone now. With the entire process essentially being driven by the difference in temperature. So once a relatively cold object touches the relatively hot core, that's when the magnetic field restarts and the process lasts for possibly 100 years or so. And because there could have been as many as 100 of these chunks of titanium over the first billion years of existence of the moon, it could easily explain the discrepancy in a lot of lunar rocks. Some rocks, as they solidified earlier, might have been experiencing relatively low magnetic field. Then, once those titanium chunks started hitting the bottom, that's when the temporary magnetic field started to increase and the rocks solidified during that time would possess very strong signals. But then once all of the titanium reached the bottom, that's when we sort of started having this weak field, which eventually disappears completely as the entire outer core reaches the temperatures where the dynamo is no longer possible. And there could have been as many as 100 of these titanium chunks hidden in the bottom. So this particular period could have lasted at least 100 times. But once again, it would only be approximately 100 years in length and would then disappear relatively quickly. And honestly, at the moment, this is probably one of the better explanations for the existence of the magnetic field on the moon. But because it's a model and a theory, it still needs to be tested. And in this case, the scientists do propose a way to potentially test this in the future. The scientists in this case suggest that by looking at Apollo samples once again, and specifically by looking not at just strong signatures, but also weaker signatures, we might be able to actually even construct the sort of a timeline showing us how exactly the magnetic field of the moon transformed and changed in the first billion years or so. So in other words, by creating a kind of a timeline and specifically focusing on the weak signatures, not just the strong signatures, it could actually become possible to prove this idea and to make this theory an actual fact and to further establish how many times these particular events happened in the past. But naturally, this would take a lot of time and a lot of different studies from a lot of different teams and would be very difficult to achieve in the next few years. Although hopefully, once we collect more samples from the moon in some of the future missions, this might become a much easier reality with some of the future collection missions, possibly even learning a little bit more about the lunar structure by doing a lot of the studies on the surface. 
But I guess for now, well, that's pretty much all I wanted to mention. It's a really interesting proposition and actually explains quite a lot about the early lunar history and in general is actually quite original and quite satisfactory, explaining a lot of stuff that we see in the lunar rocks. At the same time, because it's just a model, we need some time to prove this. On that note, once we learn something else, I'll make sure to follow this up with another video. Until then, thank you for watching, subscribe if you still haven't, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, and maybe come back tomorrow to learn something else. Maybe support this channel on Patreon by joining the channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye bye.